Well, good morning. Good morning. It is time to worship. Happy Sunday. And uh, as I was studying this morning, it was interesting that something was on my heart as it relates to God's times and seasons, his ability to do the miraculous. And if your trust is in anything but God's ability to save and redeem you, God's ability to sustain and support you, today would be a good day to reevaluate your priorities and to give God praise. Remember, a grateful heart overcomes many hardships. A grateful heart will triumph when all else fails. The center focus of a humble heart before God is the will of God. And I promise you this, He is faithful. He is faithful. That was a really good segue into the first song. There's a uh, new song uh, by Phil Wickham. It's called Battle Belongs. So. When all I see is the battle you see my victory and all I see is the mountain you see the mountain move and as I walk through the shadow and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I see through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, and if you are for me, who can be against me? Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see is the ashes. When all I see is the ashes. You see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, you see the empty tomb. When all I see is the cross. See the empty tomb. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You win every battle. Nothing stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at 
at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you
life you have been so, so good. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been good. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Because you are good. You are great. You are faithful. You are mighty. You are supply. You are ever-present help in trouble. Lord, you uh, already know the end of it all. Lord, we just pray that we are available, that we are in the right position, the right frame of mind, the right spirit to be able to participate in your plan, to carry it about that we would not grow tired of doing good. But Lord, our desires would be to uh, see your will as it is in heaven. Come to earth and, and be manifest. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for uh, our pastor. Thank you for his family. Lord, we pray protection around them, both their bodies, minds, and spirits. And uh, we thank you. And everybody said... Praise the Lord this morning. Good things are happening. Good things are going to continue to happen. Hasn't February been interesting? Well, stuff was uh, and is breaking loose in February. March will be much the same. Much of what you see breaking right now is, uh, is preparing for what needs to be planted. The season for planting is coming. Right now is an uprooting. And there are some things that are being uprooted and people that are being uprooted that don't even know that they've already been exposed. The roots of their labor, the fruit of the labor has never shown up. But the roots are now brought up. Brought up to the surface. And the interesting thing is that uh, you could find throughout scripture, anything that is rooted in rebellion will die in rebellion. It is a victim of its own making. And whenever you run into people who have rebellious hearts or attitudes or are, are continually making the same mistakes, because the same mistake made again and again, is it not a choice? Sooner or later, it's gotta be a choice. There has to be ownership. And so there are gonna be discussions of ownership that begin to unfold. Who is responsible for what? How did it happen? How did it come? And if we are sensitive, if we are humble of heart, there are always things to learn. No matter which side of the issue you are on, there are always things to learn. And uh, this morning, the, uh, the title of the sermon is Speak Soft, Walk in Authority. You know, sometimes they talk about, you know, walking a certain way and carrying a big stick, but... God does things, and if we will listen to what he is speaking and hear what it, he, what it is that he is calling us to do, um, much of the way will be cleared. You won't have to worry. God, how's this going to come about? When, it, when it's going to come about isn't really the concern. It's, Lord, make me who I need to be when it gets here. Teach me what I must know. Take me to the places I must go. Don't leave anything out. And so the challenge for our lives truly becomes that. What are we asking of God? What are we wanting from him? And the only guarantee that we truly get is that he will always be good and he will always be faithful. And anything else that we ask for outside of that and that he does, we don't deserve any of it. But any blessing beyond salvation, truly, if you were to step back and consider it with great with a grateful heart. Your mind should be blown. Plain and simple, your mind should be blown. So grab your Bibles this morning, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1 through 16. Three points we're covering this morning. Anger, one, anger cannot turn the rebel. You can't scream at an angry person and make them change their mind. Not gonna happen. 
And conversely, and a tender heart does not need a beating. So anger cannot turn to rubble and a tender heart does not need a beating. Now, in this lies two questions. One, are we rebellious? Have we, have we rejected the word of the Lord when somebody has come? Have we spoken things that God has not asked us to speak? Have we involved ourselves in things God has not asked us to be involved in? Two, how do we treat tender hearts? Do we have one? And when we encounter one, are we looking to take advantage of that? Or are we looking to cultivate it and protect it? All right? Things to be thinking about. Point two this morning. The righteous sacrifice what God asks. And hang on for this one. The evil sacrifice the righteous. Why is that? Why is that second part true? Well, because the evil do not want a conscience. They don't want something in their way. They don't want somebody speaking of what is good and what is proper, what is right. They want a clear path to destroying themselves without anybody in the way. There are going to be times that God asks you to speak and there's going to be times God asks you to be silent. Only the fool rejects wisdom. Only the fool presses forward and says that they're going to do as they please because in their eyes they see their intent is good. Every time you see someone that rejects wisdom, you're seeing, if you will, somebody that is destined for destruction. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's going to happen. Point three this morning, pursuing God challenges every aspect of our lives. Point three, pursuing God challenges every aspect of our lives. I think it's self-explanatory. Anytime we think we have everything dialed in, guess what? You're about to learn something. You're about to learn that you don't. <laughs> there are many times that uh, we think we get everything in its proper place and in the proper order only to discover that because it was our idea, it's out of order. See, God brings things to order. God brings hearts to rest. God brings minds to ease. He begins with the simple things, really, as he begins to reorder us, which is, well, and it seems complicated, but it's not. One, I have to accept the fact that I'm regularly wrong. As it relates to his will versus my will, I often do, initially, in our immaturity, we often do the things that are opposite of him. We do things according to the way we feel. And God is working to reorder such things so that we go by what is right as opposed to what we feel. All right? We have an entire generation that has been taught that feelings are fact. It may be a fact that you feel something, but it's not a fact as it relates to what is truth. It could be true for a moment, but that doesn't mean it's truth. Truth is what is the same yesterday and today forever. It is unchanging. So grab your Bible's first point this morning. Anger cannot turn a rebel or turn the rebel and a tender heart does not need a beating. Verse one through five. The plans of the heart belong to a person, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a person are clean in his own sight, but the Lord examines the motives. Dun, 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 dun. Verse three, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. Now hold on to verse three right there. Keep that one in mind. Commit your works to the Lord's. What are you doing and why are you doing it? If the Lord examines our motives, then should we not also yield our motives? And if we do, what does verse three say? And your plans will be established. Why? Because your motivations will change. Verse four, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is proud in his proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Point one, anger cannot turn the rebel and the tender heart does not need a beating. The wounded and the weary that truly desire to change will respond to discipline. Now look at verse two. All the ways of a person are clean in his own sight, but the Lord examines the motives. 
Now, if you begin to consider what it is that God is saying here, a humble person renders his motives to God. He wants them examined. He wants them looked at. The rebel says, I want everything to occur in the dark. I want every decision to be political. Why? Because their motivation is power, earthly power. And if your motivation is earthly power and sensual power, if you think about it in that fashion, then nothing truly that you are sowing is going to be eternal other than punishment. That's what you're storing up for yourself, is punishment. See, the Lord works things out for his own plan, his own way. And we step into this reality and God begins to mature us and begins to press out those things that must go in our lives. We're going to find ourselves going through a a few things. Some people today like to call it triggered. And so when we begin to suffer, quote unquote, because of old behavior being pressed out, there are times that we go through seasons of trial and tribulation that are purely emotional. They're purely emotional in our reformation of, of our mind and our heart, where the old man and the new man are at war. And how do we know that? Because the apostle Paul tells us that the man, the man's heart and the spirit of God right, will be counter to one another until the heart of the man yields to the voice of the spirit. And so the fool speaks, when the fool speaks, it will always be a lie, all right? It may be shaded in the truth, it may be showered, quote unquote, or sprinkled with truth, but it will never be about a true direction or a goal to get to a place that God has ordained. He will, the fool will claim, the liar will claim to be able to take you places they cannot because they've never been there. And they're not wor- willing to learn how to get there. See, in verse three, it says, commit your works to the Lord and he will, est- and your plans will be established. Why? Because if our works are committed to God, then our lives are committed to God. Now, here's an interesting point. It is true you are saved by grace. 100% true that you are saved by grace because your works cannot earn you salvation. But does Jesus talk about the judgment as it relates to our works? Of course he does. Does he talk about the fruit of our lives being evaluated and weighed? Of course he does. See, if God is the judge of motive, if he is the one that judges motive, then consider that he sees every corner of our heart Everywhere that bitterness is moving us, everywhere that anger is moving us, everywhere righteousness is moving us, everywhere good is taking us, he understands that that seed that is within us that is growing into something. Now remember, Jesus tells us this story about the sower and the seed, okay? There was one soil and a number of different types of, of, or I'm sorry, one seed and a number of different types of soil that things could land. When we're rooted in God, we're going to look first and foremost to be prepared by him. Soil that is properly prepared grows things. It just does. It just does. Why? Because there is care. And if you think about the nature of our heart, the Bible talks about the hard-hearted. The Bible talks about those that are calloused because of sensuality. Well, what does that th- what does that mean? It it means that nothing but of what's already in there is going to grow. And so when we become calloused and when we become hardened, when anger directs us, when foolishness guides us, that those things that God is trying to place within us will find no deep root. Yeah, we'll be excited at first because everybody's excited about something new, but ultimately it wears off, which is why the discussion within scripture is about perseverance. See, when God calls us to speak peace into injured hearts, when we begin to discuss what is right and what is wrong with those who do not have a love for war, but truly desire peace, then the sensitivity of the Spirit needs to move us first and foremost. See, typically what we run into is we begin to speak out of our own wounds when we haven't been prepared. We begin to say and do things that are out of time and season. That's why if God is calling you into ministry, don't take your wounds into that calling. Allow healing to occur now. Yes, you'll learn as you go through that season. But if your motivation isn't first and foremost 
for God to be exalted and you to be diminished, then you're going to find consistent trouble within ministry. If you remember, as Jesus comes to the forefront, does John the Baptist fight to even keep his own disciples? He doesn't. Why? Because he didn't even consider himself worthy to untie Jesus' sandals. So there is much that is going on today with regard to people talking about what they are worthy of. I find it troubling in the church that we would consider ourselves worthy of anything. It's a significant thing to be called by the name of Jesus. To be called a Christian is a blessing. Why? Because it means that we are discovering the truth of who God is and thus we are becoming Christ-like. It does not mean that we gain in and of ourselves a value apart from Christ. We've never had any value apart from Christ. It is Christ, our creator, that gives us value. He places it in us. It is a sacred thing. It is a restorative work because his intention was that we would never fall. Our intention was equality. God's intention was to cultivate us and to protect us, to, to literally give us what we needed. And so now we live in a fallen state and yet God still provides exactly what we need. A hard heart hates discipline. They love war. Remember I was talking about the humble? They don't like war. They don't look for enemies. They know that they are the problem 99.9% .9 of the time. So they look to God to correct their own heart before they go correct anyone else, which is Jesus' point as it relates to the plank and to the speck. If there's hypocrisy in us, how are we going to correct anybody? Why do, the, why do the hateful, why do the undisciplined love war? Because they always need an enemy to blame. They always need somebody to pit themselves against. They need a distraction because their injury has become their God. Their wound has become their God. See, if you're close to God, quote unquote, then your wounds begin to diminish. If your wounds are always on the surface, and you claim a relationship with God, then what has happened to that aspect of healing that he's promised? Why has it been withheld? That is something to pray into. That's something to be considered. Lord, why are these things still so fresh? It doesn't mean that we won't mourn the loved, loved ones that we've lost. It won't mean that we won't regret the things that we've done or even be embarrassed at points. But we have a place to come back to, and that is the foot of cro the cross, where we deliver ourselves again and again, saying, Lord, it's still, there's still something binding me. There's still something holding me. Freedom is what you promised. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Continue to go back to that same place. When Jesus talks about hypocrisy, there's a story in Luke chapter 11, 37 through 41. Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees and the Pharisees invited him to lunch. And Jesus did not go along with the ceremonial hand washing. <gasps> oh no! Here's what happens. Verse 38 of Luke 11. When the Pharisees saw this, he was surprised. When the Pharisees saw this, he was surprised that Jesus had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but your inside is full of greed and wickedness. Notice that it's very clear the Lord judges motives. What did he say? On the outside, you guys dress up great. You clean the outside of the dish, but who would want a dish that has a dirty, dirty inside, right? Where, like a bowl where you put your cereal. So you just clean the outside and you keep filling it up. Nobody's gonna do that, which is the point that Jesus is making. You clean the outside of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. He says in verse 40, you foolish ones, did he, God, who made the outside not make the inside also, but give that which is within as a charitable gift, and then all things are clean for you. In essence, if we will handle the work of the heart with the Father, then our perspective of things become clean and clear. I was listening to a discussion this morning about a well-known pastor who has taught a very strange thing about the relationship between David and Jonathan in the Old Testament. 
And the more he began to speak about that relationship, he began to reveal a wound in his own heart. He began to feel a, reveal a misconception as it relates to love. And there were blinders on him because he could only see one type of relationship. He could only understand one type of relationship. And the entire thing became sensual. It was not a discussion in his mind of brotherly love, but far more. Well, what is that rooted in? That's not rooted in a proper perspective of interpersonal relationship. That is rooted in injury. And so it begins to invade every relationship that person has. See, we think that sometimes we can hide what is going on in us. It doesn't say that in the word. It doesn't say we can hide it. It says, in fact, that our sins will find us out. Why do our sins betray us? How, how come? Well, one, that is their entire intention is to betray us. They don't have any interest in helping us whatsoever. It's like people that are dedicated to evil. On Sometimes I hear people talk about, you know, right versus left, and the left seems always so unified. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're, they're beating themselves to pieces behind closed doors. Anybody that has an intention rooted in evil is never going to actually be cooperative. They're always looking to dominate one another. That's why even as I deal with other pastors or other, you know, organizations that are church, you know, church affiliated or a group of churches, the question I always have is, how do they treat one another? Because Jesus says very clearly that we will be known by the way we love one another. And so when I see politics going on and a bunch of men that are, that are passive aggressive or just won't speak the truth, I don't have a lot of interest in dealing with that. I'll just be honest. Why? Because there's always an ulterior motive. Everybody's always working to, you know, feel things out in one way or another. And when we're dedicated to the work of the gospel, which is what we should be, why is there the rest of this? Well, that comes down to the intentions of men. That comes down to the goals rooted in injury. Somebody felt ignored. Somebody felt oppressed. Somebody felt without. But when Christ comes, there is freedom from all of those things that are rooted in injury. God is calling us out of them. Just like it was that Jesus came across the man who was bound in chains in the cemetery. Remember, well, at points he had been bound in chains and they couldn't keep him bound because he was so full of evil and the demonic, he could break the chains at any point. And Jesus does what? Jesus frees him. And it's an interesting thing. When Jesus frees him from the demonic possession, Legion was the name because there were many, the man asks to go with Jesus and says, Jesus does what? Jesus says, no, you're going to go back to your family. Why? Because there's things there that have to be undone before you go do anything else. See, a man is called to be the priest of his home. And if your home is in disorder, how can you possibly go anywhere else and actually minister? Don't let the church, the church is essential. You must be involved. Even in ministry, you must be involved. But your priority, if it is anything other than your home first, as it relates to leading them to the church and walking ahead of them as you are headed towards healing, that is not a good motivation. God will judge the motivation of the heart because he knows what you're doing. That's why repentance is so important. People go, man, do you just want me to come to the altar every Sunday and pray, pray, pray? I want you to come to the altar and get the perspective that the Spirit is attempting to give you. The mindset, the understanding of there are still things that need to be changed. Yes, you're here on Sunday morning. Applause, because there are many things you could be doing that could be a distraction. So we prioritize the church, but in the process, we have to prioritize Christ. And as we prioritize Christ, there has to be a change of heart. And it's not just a one-time thing. It is consistent it is steady. Point two this morning in verse six, uh, the righteous sacrifice what God asked, the evil sacrifice the righteous. Verse six, by mercy and truth and atonement is made for wrongdoing. And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil when a person's ways are pleasing to the Lord. He causes even his enemies to make peace with him. Better is a little righteousness than the great, 
Better is a little righteous, or better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. Verse 9, the mind of a person plans his ways, way, but the Lord directs his steps. Verse 10, a divine verdict is on the lips of the king. His mouth should not err in judgment. A just balance and scales belong to the Lord. All the weights of the bag are his concern. Verse 12, it is an abomination for kings to commit wicked acts because a throne is established on righteousness. The righteous sacrifice, point two, the righteous sacrifice what God asks, the evil sacrifice the righteous. And this point simply means this, that as the fear of the Lord keeps us from doing wrong things, so also the hatred of God will lead once to persecute those who do what is right. See, there is no loss when we sacrifice what God has called to be given. And if we want advancement within the kingdom, then we have to be ready to give even more. See, it was, and we'll see this in our, our next verse, but as it relates to Esau sacrificing his birthright, Hebrews tells it very clearly that Esau was an immoral man. How do we know that even from the story of Jacob and Esau? It's because his judgments, his scale, his point of reference was so off that he could not see sacrificing and or even suffering a bit of discomfort as it related to his flesh for future things. You see, the central don't see time the way God has asked us to see time. When we're sensually minded, we think the next few steps. When we are heavenly minded, when we are kingdom oriented, we will see where the steps lead 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 generationally, if you think about it, eternally. Where do these next few steps take me? What am I unwilling to go through right now that my children will face or my children's children will face? What is it that I am forsaking that God has asked me to war against in this season so they never have to see the harm from these bad decisions? What is God asking me to do? What is he willing to take me through? And God, see, with God, things are limitless. We'll come up against our own threshold, how far we can go, how far we can be stretched. But Jesus says, apart from him, everything's impossible. But in him, all things are possible. If you're wondering what the next season looks like and you're standing back going, it looks impossible. Fantastic. It's time to get in touch with the one that does the impossible. See, all too often we look for for fighting, we look for, you know, things to avoid as it relates to whether we're going to take something on or we're going to, we, we don't even like the decision as to whether we're going to address something. And here's the interesting th part about going deeper in your relationship with God. It's going to demand some decisions. It's going to demand bravery. It's going to demand we encounter portions of our life that we do not like and other portions of our life that God is asking us to move further in. Even in my own life, there have been points that I have addressed things in my life that I don't like, and then there's areas where I become very comfortable as it relates to my relationship with God, because I'm like, I'm growing, and I'm doing what you're asking me to do, and the Lord says, yes, but I need you to go even further, and I need you to go even deeper, and I'm asking you to broaden your horizons, and I'm doing this, but, but God, I've got a good handle on this. And the Lord says, that I haven't asked you to do that. I'm asking you to go through the steps and the stages that I am putting before you because there is something greater beyond this. And so it's not that God ever limits our destiny, if you will. It's that we limit it by our unwillingness to continually, to continue, <laughs> I'll get it right, continue to be uncomfortably stretched and to be pushed and to remain faithful and to persevere. Well, Lord, I, I've stopped cussing and I've stopped doing this and I've stopped doing that. Fantastic. Now, let's deal with your anger issues at the root. So you've got the outside looking good. You've stopped blowing up and losing your temper. That's great. Good step. Now let's get down to what started all the mess. Oh, no, no, no. I want you to stay out of there. 
and the Lord is loving and merciful, he's going to take us to those places and show us the things that we need to see. All right? Remember this. Whatever is gained in rebellion will be lost to another rebel. The darkness wars with everything, not just what is good. That's why people that believe there's power in darkness are silly. They will fight other people in darkness, and they will fight the righteous. Okay? They'll, fight, they'll end up fighting everybody. A righteous man can only align with what is righteous. And this is the discussion of kings that claim to be righteous as well. In their mind, if they are not under authority, they will believe they are the final authority. And the interesting thing about believing you're the final authority is it typically trends towards abusive behavior. But if you have the fear of God and in your heart and your mind, he is in focus, then you know you will have to answer for the things that he is talking about or is instructed. I'm sorry, my dogs are going crazy outside right now. So it's a little bit distracting. Paul talks about that as, this as he writes to Timothy in 1, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 8 through 10. He talks about how our scales can be off, how we can be, you know, unestablished, if you will, in our mindset. He says this very clearly. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and worldly, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, murderers, the sexual immorality, immor sexually immoral, homosexuals, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. See, when we believe that we're the final authority in an issue, as it even relates over the control of our own lives, our own thoughts, our own feelings, we will find trouble. Paul is saying, in essence, you come up against the law if you are in unrighteousness. See, the righteous man looks at the law. He sees it. He understands it. But his goal is to please God. Therefore, the law becomes secondary because not that it is unimportant, but his primary goal is pleasing God. God is the final authority. God is the say over each and every thing. And so his path is directed by the voice of the Spirit because now the law is written on his heart. See, for those that it has to be in front, for those that have to be punished by it and because of it, their, their primary goal is not the pleasing of God. It is their own will. It is their own way. And you'll see this in the church and you will see this outside of the church. Absolutely true. I've seen many pastors walk themselves clean off a cliff because they've never addressed an injury. Many of the guys that I run into that are dealing with this, and I'll be blunt, primarily the injury is, is a father injury. It's either fatherlessness or a father who is calloused and consumed with his own identity and his own, his own injuries. And if those things are not addressed early on in our hearts and lives, they, they take root and they do a lot of damage. And we begin to then reproduce the same thing we suffered right? It's just like a parent that it was in their childhood disciplined far too much. And so they make a determination that they're not going to discipline their children at all. Both are equally abusive. The scale is off. It's not that there was no need for discipline. It's that you suffered abuse in a certain situation. And so then to swing 180 degrees the other day, the pendulum, or the uh, other way, excuse me, the pendulum swings all the way to the other side and we think that's not going to be abusive. So the Lord calls us to find balance. He calls us to find what is steady and sure and certain. And if you're led by what is right, you will not be led by your emotions. Say that again. If you're led by what is right, you will not be led by what is in your emotions. Point three this morning, verses 13 through 16. Pursuing God challenges every aspect of our lives. And in this, no matter what we are facing, we must submit to God. Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and the one who speaks right is loved 
The fury of the, king, fury of the king is like messengers of death, but a wise person will appease it. In the light of the king's face is life, and his favor is like a cloud with the spring rain. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding is to be chosen above silver. See, no matter what it is that the world promises, no matter what it is that they offer, a failure to submit to God will lead you to harder and harder times. And if you want to see wealth in your life, don't focus on the money. That's not the discussion. Focus on what is right. Focus on doing what is good. Do not allow the enemy a second of your time. Do not allow it to be wasted. And here is why that is important. When the enemy gets even a second or a period of time, he leads us and we will trend, as I used that word earlier, we will trend towards abuse. We will trend towards, a distract, towards distraction and isolation. But here's what changes, is a grateful heart will triumph in every season, no matter how bad it is. See, when we're facing like this discussion with the wrath of the king, no, we're not, we're talking about earthly kings in this context, which is only a fool goes in and starts that kind of trouble. But how is it that we're shaping our, our attitude and our mindset as it relates to the king of kings and the Lord of lords? So are we treating our Christianity haphazardly do we believe that sin will go unpunished? Do we believe there's a consequence? Or do we believe that grace covers all no matter what? See, when we don't understand that there needs to be a constant reverence for God, when we haven't been taught about the sacredness of our relationship and the significance of our relationship, see, these are things that need to happen at home and in the house of God. But the more we are without those things, without those understandings, the more we will see God as an option as opposed to the only path. See, no matter what tomorrow holds, God is always faithful. God is always good. See, when sensuality rules our mindset, when our hearts are not ruled by peace, we will make war in areas we should have never been. We will make peace in areas that we were not called to make peace. Instead, we were actually called to take a stand. Many times I've seen people challenge things that God had not called them to. Take even churches and ministries, they were not called to lead. Why? Because they were ruled by injury. They wanted to be recognized and they wanted to be appreciated. Let me ask you this question. What is more important in your life? What is the most important, if you think about it, thing in your life right now? And if the thought was not honoring God, then things are out of balance. If the thought was not giving him priority, then things are out of balance. See, when things are out of balance, we will challenge what cannot be moved, and we will move what should have never been touched. When things are out of balance, we will challenge what cannot be moved and we will move what should have never been touched. Let me take you back to the story of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant home. If you remember right, the first time they tried this, they put it on a cart and it cost a man his life because the cart shook when the oxen stumbled and it seemed that the Ark was going to fall and a man reached out to steady it and he touched the ark of God. And David was not only angry, but he was scared. And why did this happen? Because David had treated the ark haphazardly. See, every time we would treat our relationship with God haphazardly, when we touch or try to negotiate or move what is sacred, what will happen? There will be a loss. And why, don't, why do we do this? Because we don't wanna be uncomfortable, because we're set in our ways. God is not asking us to be set in our ways. He's asking us to be established in his ways. If you look at Hebrews chapter 12, 14 through 16, Paul writes this, and I think it's Paul. Okay, you can argue with that, but I just do, all right? As it relates to the writer of Hebrews. It says this, Pursue peace with all people and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 15, 
See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his birth own birthright for a single meal. If you think about the opportunities that are in front of us in this next season, is there any need to be without humility? Is there any need to be proud? There's not. Why? Because we've seen the hand of God work. And what do we need to add? Do we need to be like Moses who struck the stone when God had just merely called him to speak? No. Why would we come short? Why would we do that? The Lord has called us to finish this race and to finish it well. So let's run it in the way that he's called us to run it. Let's do it according to his will and his way. And in doing so, God will bring favor in areas that we didn't think was possible. When someone wants war and God has called us to peace, then let's be at peace. When somebody's asking for peace and it is an area that we know that God has called us to war and to do so without compromise, then we do it. And there is a scriptural example for every one of these. Remember what Samuel says to Saul when Samuel wants to, when Saul wants to change the plan is that obedience is better than sacrifice. See, God is calling us to give something very specific. It is our time, our attention, and all of our effort. And as he begins to manifest in us those things that are of him, and there's been a heavy concentration on it this morning, all uncleanliness needs to be uprooted. Sanctification needs to occur. Verse 16, one more time of, he, of Proverbs 16. How much better it is to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen above silver. Pray with me this morning. Father, we give you glory and we call upon your name. Lord, you know the season ahead of us. You know the things that are in store. So why would we worry or why would we fret? Because Lord, the upright you have seen and you know. You've seen what they faced. You've seen what they've gone through. You've seen the intent of the wicked. You've seen the work of the blind. And you have prevailed. And you will continue to do so. So God, let us avoid all mindsets rooted in anger or anxiety. For Lord, you've declared that nothing that has been done will go unpunished that all things have been seen, and not only that, that all things will be revealed. And Lord, these works are by you, and they are for you, and in you they hold together. And so if you are what binds all things together, then Father, why would we ever choose to be unbound? So Lord, this morning that we would rededicate, and that we would prepare. And as the season unfolds ahead of us, let us rejoice as victory is delivered to your church. And that all men would lift holy hands to praise you. That gratitude would return to the peoples of God. That all nations and tongues would return to praising your name. And they would praise you daily with time and attention spent in your word. Lord, and we just begin to speak those things that are of you and we call upon you, O oh God, to reveal the truth in every season, in every fashion. Let the walls fall. Let those things that were meant to be obscured and hidden come into light. Let the minds of all of those that were rooted in fear begin to awaken. Let not only the church see, but those who were, without, were outside the walls at this point see that the intent of man has been nothing but evil and that the will of God is for our salvation and our security. Let every one of those who desire to do damage to your bride, the church, God, let their strength dissolve 
Let their covering disappear. Let your hand be set against them, O God, for the time and the season that must be, so that ultimately, if it be possible, God, they would yield, that they would turn from their ways, that they would see that what has been planned is wicked, that they would come forward with the truth, that they would repent for what has been taken and those who have suffered under their hand, and that truly freedom would come. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen and amen. All right. Four o'clock today. The weather's amazing. Let's meet up at Peterson Park. For those of you that have some numbers, make some phone calls. Call a few people. Tell them to come hang out. Four o'clock. Prayer. Peterson Park. Today. Hope to see you there. Hang in there. Know that you are loved and you are prayed for. God is on the throne. Don't worry. Four o'clock.